Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me. After your manner with those who loved your name, establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Yesterday I was coming back from a uh, Bible study event with my daughters. Well, it was actually a father-daughter pool party, um, but <laughs> Bible study just, you know. And turned on the radio on the, on the way back and heard our, our president speaking of, he was giving his radio address about the need for military intervention in Syria, and it was essentially a, a call to arms, and this is not what I was expecting on the the drive home, I, I turned it up and it was clear that there was a seriousness or sobriety to his, his appeal, that he was laying out a case of horrible injustice and that their only recourse is military intervention, drastic military intervention, going to war. And this is, I mean, this is more significant than the normal radio address. I, I turned it up and as I'm driving, kind of fixated on the words here, I look into the back seat after a few minutes and find my daughters going to sleep. <laughs> I lean over my shoulder and, and say, this is, this is important. Wake up. <laughs> this is about war. Listen. <laughs> and one of my daughters says, I'm tired. And the other one of my daughters says nothing, but her eyes say, I'm two years old. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that so many Christians have that attitude towards the war that is going on in our souls that we're so dismissive of it, that we treat it lightly. We don't understand that there is a war that is taking place in our soul and it is about eternity. That sin is waging war in our hearts and it is after our soul, it's after our joy, it's after our relationship with the Lord. It wants to destroy it, it wants to take our thoughts captive, it wants to rob us of our joy, it wants to steal our salvation if it were able. It is bringing full force warfare into our hearts. And it discourages me that there are so many Christians that don't see the danger in being a follower of God. They don't see that they're caught up in warfare. They have the attitude of, of my daughters. Can I go to sleep? What does this have to do with, with me? What has everything to do with you? It's about you. You are at war. And if you don't realize that you've already been taken captive... That's the reality of the passage we just read in Psalm 119. The psalmist is fighting sin. He is locked in a death battle with sin and either he will yield or sin will yield, but he is not giving up. All through this psalm, he's talked about being surrounded by his enemies, his enemies laying traps for him, his enemies laying snares for him, his enemies seeking to ambush him. And in many ways, they're actual physical enemies. He was a leader of his people. His country had invaded other countries. It's no wonder he has enemies around him. So in some sense, we can dismiss a lot of his warnings as, you know, we're not political leaders. We're not in an actual literal physical warfare with a foreign nation. So we dismiss it. But in this stanza, he brings it home. He brings it home to the war that is on in the soul. It's not about the external enemies. It's not about the, the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Phoenicians, whoever was attacking Israel and Daniel's people at the time. It's about the war against sin in his own heart. And in that sense, it has complete continuity with us. This is our battle that he describes. The battle wages on. In many ways, sin was defeated at the cross. The penalty for sin was paid for at the cross when Jesus died. The, the deed of sin was nailed to the cross and it was canceled. It was ripped in two. It was paid and there is no more penalty for sin for those who believe in Jesus Christ. 
In many ways, the power of sin was defeated at our conversion. When the Holy Spirit changed our heart, the power of sin was driven out. Sin no longer is our master. We are not slaves to sin. Instead, we're slaves to righteousness. So in many ways, the power of sin has been vanquished. But in very real ways, the presence of sin remains. God did not remove us from the presence of sin. And that makes sense in a lot of ways. If you understand that the purpose of creation is to glorify God and glorify His Son, Jesus Christ, the purpose of salvation is to see the glory of Christ, that he rescues his people. Then the purpose of sanctification is to fight against sin and magnify the glory of God into the world, to display to the world how much more we love God than we love sin, to display to the world how much greater God is than sin is. And this is why God leaves us in the battle. But the battle is real and it is for your soul. Let me show you how real it is. This is what Paul says in Romans eight thirteen: For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, what does he mean with die and live? He's talking about eternity here. He's talking about eternal life. He doesn't mean if you live according to the flesh, you will die a physical death. Well, of course you will. Everybody dies a physical death. Paul died a physical death. Jesus died a physical death. Everybody dies a physical death. It has nothing to do with if you live according to sin or righteousness. Listen, if you're a descendant of Adam, you're going to die unless the Lord comes back first. If you live according to the flesh, you will die spiritually and eternally. That is the battle. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh or of the body, you will live. That's what's at stake in this war. The phrase by the Spirit captures right there that you are not earning your salvation by this fight. It's Spirit-empowered, grace-induced combat. It's the Spirit who causes this battle. It's the Spirit who brings this battle to the forefront of your life. But the battle is real and it's about your soul. And if you don't wage it, you will die, Paul says. John Owen, the Puritan, put it much more simply than this. He said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And that's the truth. Sin is attacking you and your soul and either you will win or sin will win. Either you will die or sin will die. Someone's going to die. There will be blood. (laughs) And it is in your soul. You're in the fight. If you're descended from Adam, this fight is yours. There are no innocent civilians in this combat. There's no collateral damage, so to speak. Everybody who is a child of Adam has this battle waging in their heart. There's no neutrality here. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil against those who love the Lord. And that's it. Everyone's involved. At the heart of this passage is a description of that warfare. The psalmist finds himself locked into this battle. The language is most clear in verse 133. Establish my footsteps in your word. That phrase establish means, you know, create a defensive foothold for me here. Create a beachhead. Clear out a place. Let me have a a defensive setup, a place for protection and entrenchment that he can wage battle from. Do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. That phrase, have dominion over me, it's a, it's a Hebrew term of warfare. Do not let my soul be conquered, defeated, vanquished by sin. When you're at war, if the enemy comes in, he ransacks your city, he conquers your, your, your city, he tears down the wall, he busts through the gate, and he puts his flag right in the middle. And he's saying, don't let sin do this to me. Don't let sin claim my heart. My heart is at battle against sin, and I don't want to lose it. I don't want the flag of sin flying over my life. In many ways, this is the final cry from from the Alamo of the soul. He's crying out, God, do not let iniquity win. Don't let it win. And the rest of the passage describes this holy war. Let me describe this war for you. Our strategy in this war. First, you have to know your enemy. Know your enemy. Verse 133 that I just read describes your enemy. It calls it iniquity. Iniquity is the one who's bringing the attack. It's sin. The word iniquity, the Hebrew word iniquity, it's got two glosses in the the lexicon, two different ways to render it. One is the kind of temptation that produces sin. The other is the kind of emptiness that produces idolatry. It's a powerful word. He's saying, don't let 
the frivolity of life provoke me to sin and don't let the emptiness of life provoke me to idolatry. I don't want to fill my life with pleasures that are contrary to God's nature. I don't want to fill my life with enjoyments or substitutes for God. I don't want my emptiness to provoke idolatry and I don't want what I fill the emptiness with to provoke sin, he's saying. I don't want sin to win. The psalmist knows his enemy. He's seen physical enemies his whole life. He's surrounded by them elsewhere in the psalm. But here he knows that he has seen the enemy and it's him. It's in his heart. The enemy is in his soul. This is how Peter says it in 1 Peter 2.11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Who is the enemy? It's your fleshly lust. It's the desire in your flesh, in your body. That is where the battle is. That's who's bringing the battle to your doorstep. And notice the term that Peter uses. They wage war. This is all about warfare. Sin, it seems, can never be defeated. It remains a reality for us. God doesn't remove it from us. No matter how many times we think it's defeated, it rears its head again. It tempts you, it tempts you, you resist, you resist, you go to sleep, you wake up, and it's there again ringing the doorbell. And you think, I said no to you yesterday. Why are you back today? But this is the reality the rest of our life. It doesn't go away. Has anyone ever permanently defeated sin? Have you ever got to a point in your life where you no longer deal with lust or with pride or with materialism or with the fear of man? Have you got to a point in your life where, hey, you no longer get angry? If you think you have, come see me afterwards. <laughs> I'd like to stomp on your foot. <laughs> it's a good antidote to that bad theology. You never get to the point where you conquer sin. It is always there and it is always fighting. That's the nature of the believer's life. That's why the New Testament describes the believer's life as a battle against it. Ephesians six twelve. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's the reality of this warfare. And it's not a battle we can afford to lose. We have to buffet our bodies, Paul says. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus and fight like eternity depends on it. And when you're successful in your fight, you can't get arrogant because you know that the enemy didn't go away. It's back the next day. I used to coach soccer, high school soccer, and at halftime, occasionally we'd be winning. <laughs> Never once did I see the opposing team say, we're down three goals, let's pack it up and go home. Why bother with the second half? Oftentimes, if I detected arrogance in my team, I would have them look at the other team's bus. It's still there in the parking lot. There's the other team. They're not going anywhere. They're going to be back for the second half. It doesn't matter if the game is out of reach. They're still showing up. In many ways, the penalty and the power of sin was defeated at the cross. But it's still here. It's still fighting. We carry about this body of sin and death with us everywhere, and it is waging war against us. It wants to take us down. It wants to kill us. It wants to crush our joy. We can defeat it. We can kill it. We can resist it. We can think we've banished it, and we wake up the next day, and there it is, cane-like, crouched at the door with its desire to have mastery over us. And every day we have to choose to fight it. That's the enemy. Well, secondly, you have to identify the battlefield. The enemy is sin. You have to identify the battlefield. Where does this battle take place? Is it in a, a field somewhere? Is it against people wearing a uniform under a national flag? Of course not. Our enemy is not identifiable in a photo lineup. It takes on different forms. And because of that, the Christian must know where the battle takes place. And the battle takes place in the soul, in the heart, in the mind, in the affections, or in the members of your body, as Paul says. It takes place inside of you. Wherever the battle presents itself at the moment, that's where you need to fight. It's not the same every day. Notice it's, in, it's internal, though. Look at verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. You, I've said this over and over again through Psalm 119. This is never a psalm about external obedience. He's not after outward conformity to the law. He's not after you doing things with your hand or going places with your feet. He's not after 
outward expressions of righteousness. He's not after you loving your, your enemies by giving to them or loving your neighbors by giving to them. He's not after you loving the, the, the least by meeting their needs. He's not after those external expressions. Those are all good things and they're commanded by scripture. That's not what he's after. He's after the joy that is in the heart. That's where the battle takes place. He says that. Therefore, my soul observes them. He's not concerned about what his hands are doing or what his feet are doing or where his eyes are going. He's concerned about what his soul is believing. And that's the power of the word of God. It is powerful enough to captivate the affections, to captivate the heart, to captivate the mind. That's the strength and the glory and the beauty of the word of God. It takes the war and the victory to the soul, to the inside. Verse 131, I opened my mouth wide and panted. Another powerful word picture of the inward nature of the battle. It's describing an animal that is so desperate for water, its, its mouth is hanging open, panting and begging for water. He's saying that's the way that his soul needs God's word. That's the way that his soul needs to love God. That's the way that his affections need to be dependent upon God, that he's begging. If you don't get water, you die. If you don't get God's word, your soul withers. That's what he's saying here. It's all about the inside. You have to ID the battle at the basic level of affections. This is how James says it. James 4.1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? The source of this battle is the pleasures, James says. The things you delight in, the things that you desire in your body, that is what is waging war against your soul. What satisfies you, James is asking? Sin or substance? Sin or scripture? Who do you want to please, God or man? What's your motivation? Do you Receive pleasure from sinful things. That's the question. And the truth is, you have to fight for what you love. You can tell the worth of a person by the worth of the objects they love. A silly person loves silly things. A sinful person loves sinful things. And a godly person loves godly things. It really is that basic. Your affections define you. Your emotions define you. The things that you love, the things that you delight in define you. And that's exactly why the battle takes place inside. It's all about getting you to love the right things. And that's why God's word is so powerful. Because it can alter the emotions. What if a friend of mine was murdered? And what if I took the knife that killed him and put it on my wall in a frame and admired it every day, leaving the blood stains on it. What if I befriended his killer? We chatted every afternoon. We went for walks together. We became friends. Would you not rightly think that I was a co-conspirator? Wouldn't you rightly think that I was involved with the murder in some way? How could I be friends with the one who did this? Do you recognize that when you have pleasure for sin, that that's what you're doing? That sin killed Jesus Christ and you're harboring the very knife that slew him, you're harboring that in your heart and you're delighting in it? You cannot be entertained by that for which Christ was crucified. Sin is not for entertainment value. And that's the way the war works. It goes into your heart. And listen, this is the next stage of that war. The very knife that you keep on your wall is exactly what the devil will use to kill you. You cannot be entertained by that for which Christ was crucified. You cannot love sin and build up a delight for it and an immunity for it in your hearts because it will corrupt your pleasure. It will corrupt your pleasure. <laughs> Better to find a hole that stretches to the middle of the earth and cast the knife into there. Be done with it. Because that's what sin's goal is, to get you to love it. This is why the battle takes place in the heart. This is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we're ready to punish all disobedience. You see the wartime words there? We're destroying those 
lofty things as speculations as idolaters saw so they're raised up against God and we're taking them captive. We are taking our thoughts captive. The battle is for our thoughts and we are stealing them. We are protecting them. They're our captives. They're not going to get stolen by the enemy. Don't let your thoughts get kidnapped by the devil. Don't let your thoughts fall in love with sin. Don't let your mind meditate on sin. You take those thoughts back. They're yours. Put handcuffs on them. Protect them. They belong to you. When you do that, you punish disobedience. You drive it away by guarding your thoughts. You think about what is pure. You think about what is true. You think about what is noble. You think about what is praiseworthy. You think about what is righteous. You think about what is pleasing to God. That's how you guard your thoughts. You defend them. They belong to you. The reality is there's only two ways sin can worm itself into your soul, through your affections and through your mind. And so that's where it's after. Last week, my house had a bit of an ant problem. Tiny little, tiny little ants. And I became the ant stalker. I followed them. I was in the hunt. I didn't want to just squash them. I wanted, I wanted to know the source. So I stalked the ants. I followed them. I hunted them. And I saw where they were coming in and out. This tiny little hole in my wall. So I got a, a cocking gun. <laughs> And I filled every single hole in every wall. I became obsessive about it, hunting. <laughs> Looks like a Dalmatian shook everywhere in the house. I don't expect the ants to go away. They'll find another hole. And you know what? I'll find them there. <laughs> Bring an ant. Sin is trying to worm its way into your affections. You have to find where it's coming from. You have to find what is taking your thoughts away, what is taking your joys away. You have to find where it's worming its way in and you have to bring the battle there. Cut it off. Close those thought patterns. Close those pleasures. Get rid of them if they're causing you to love sin. Get rid of them if they're causing you to think about sin. Take the battle to where the sin is entering in. That's the way this is played. That's the way this fight is won. <laughs> There's more at stake in this than your kitchen. This is how Paul says in Romans 7, 23, I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Listen, if you lose this battle, you won't just find your thoughts captive by the enemy. You yourself will be held captive. That's what Paul says. It's making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is worming its way in through his body. Well, you don't just have to know the battlefield. You have to also take your weapon. Take your weapon. We're not unarmed in this battle. Look at verse 130. The unfolding of your word gives lights. This word unfolding, it's, you know, it sounds like in English, unfolding sounds like a rose. But in the Hebrew, it's a, it means unsheathing a sword. It's onomatopoetic. It's a sound that a sword makes when it comes out of a scabbard. Shunk. And what is unfolded? The sword of God's word. You bring out God's word and it radiates light. What a powerful word picture. The sword comes out, the light shines into the world. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. That word simple, it means not from the world's perspective naive, but it means somebody who's just simply dependent on God's word. He's simple concerning evil. He doesn't want to think about what's evil because he, he wants to be innocent concerning evil is how the New Testament says it. The world would consider that person naive. Scripture considers that person teachable. And that's how powerful the word of God is. That it can take the most simple, naive from the world's perspective, the most simple person, and transform them into a bastion of wisdom. That's what God's word does. That's the weapon in this warfare. God's word unfolds and it brings light. It drives out darkness. It drives out ambiguity. It casts light onto where sin is coming from. It casts light onto the dangers of sin. It exposes it. This is why those who love sin love the darkness. They don't want their deeds exposed, Jesus says in John 3. But this is what the word of God does. It exposes evil deeds. The psalmist is here in battle and he's calling in an airstrike of light. <laughs> He wants light to come in. 
This is the, the weapon that we have. It's God's word. Look at verse 135. Make your face shine upon your servant. Now it's God's own countenance that is giving light. Giving light to those who serve him, those who are God's slaves. He lights their path. It's the very luminescence of God he's asking for. He wants to be a beneficiary of God's own illumination. Asking God's face to shine light on him. This is how Paul says it, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. We do not war according to the flesh. Again, the war language. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is the scripture Paul's talking about. That's our weapon. We take our thoughts captive with it. We meditate on scripture. We guard our affections with it by filling our joy with scripture. And that really is the theme of Psalm 119 over and over and over again. The longest chapter in the Bible is a chapter about the Bible. The longest poem in the Bible is a poem about the power of God's word. It's an acrostic of 22 stanzas, all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, eight verses for each letter, A to Z, over and over and over again. Almost every single verse is about the power of God's word. Look at the one before us this morning, verse 129. Your testimonies, God's word, are wonderful. The unfolding, verse 130, of your words gives light. Verse 131, he's panting for your commandments. Verse 133, establish my footsteps in your word. 134, I want to keep your precepts. 135, teach me your statutes. 136, they're not keeping your law. It's all about God's word. That's what the weapon is. The psalmist is saying that he needs God to give him light so that he can use God's word. In other words, he's going into this, this battle knowing he needs God to give him his word. That's what he's begging for. Well, not only do you have to use your weapon, you also have to know your ally. You have to trust your ally. Put confidence in the person you're aligned with. You're not in this battle alone. You have an ally on your side. Verse 129 gives us a hint of this. Your testimonies are wonderful. That word wonderful means outside of our experience. They're supernatural. They're outside of the human world of experience. God's word is in many ways outside of its creation. He condescends to us. He gives us his word in human language so that we can understand it. But we know that it speaks a truth that is outside of God's creation. It's a supernatural revelation to us. When you believe the Bible, you're not carried along by cleverly invented tales. You're not believing things that are made up by people. You're believing the very words of God, that people were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. It's something that's outside of our experience. But our ally becomes more clear in verse 133. Establish my footsteps in your word. And then, sorry, back in verse 132. Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who love your name. That phrase, turn to me and be gracious to me according to or after the manner in which. It's, a, it's another war phrase. It means according to the covenant or according to the treaty that we've made. He's saying, God, we have a treaty here. We have a treaty. If I'm attacked by sin, you help defend me. That's what he's saying. It's not a treaty for everybody. God didn't make it with everyone. Look at the, how it's limited. After the manner with those who love your name. And the psalmist is saying, that's the deal. I'm loving who you are. The name just means all of your attributes. What you stand for. The psalmist says, I love you, God. And so you need to help me. Another way of saying it, I wouldn't have gotten to this battle against sin if I thought I would have to do it on my own. <laughs> we had some terms of, en of engagement pretty clearly spelled out. <laughs> And when sin rises up against me, God, we had a deal. You would come defend me according to the way that you always respond to those who love you. The psalmist is saying, you are my ally. I wouldn't have got into this battle if I was doing this alone. In other words, he got into this battle knowing that God would help them. Which gets back to the theological problem that maybe you've been thinking about the last 30 minutes, back from Romans 8, 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If sin wins this battle, you're on your way to hell. So that raises this question. Does that mean that you can lose your salvation? Does that mean that sin can win and you can be robbed of your eternal joy? And the answer is no. 
You even know that at the end of Romans 8 where this is what God has appointed you for glorification, that he will glorify you. God will win. But not only has he appointed the ends, he's also appointed the means and the means is the fight. The end is glory. The means to getting there is the fight. Here's a simple human analogy. It's kind of silly, but I think it, it makes the point. If I tell my daughter, your room will be clean when you go to bed. I have determined that, and it is a fact. <laughs> she goes to bed. There's stuff all over the floor. Well, come clean your foot. No, you said that it would be clean, so you, I'm holding you to your word. You better clean it. <laughs> it's like, no, not only did I choose that it would be clean, I also chose the means by which it would be cleaned. <laughs> Get out of bed. <laughs> God not only chose the end, which is our glorification, he chose the means by which we get there, the fight against sin. That we're battling against sin. And eternity does hang in the balance. It's not a fake fight. We're not boxing shadows here. It's not staged. It's a real fight for your soul. And you better be in it because God hasn't removed us from sin. John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Well, that's not how that paragraph ends. Let me read you the rest of it. He that is appointed to kill an enemy, if he leaves striking before the other ceases living, has done only half the job. Certainly his enemy will rise again and finish the job that he was too weak or cowardly to do the first time. It's a graphic illustration. If you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat with somebody to the death and you beat him halfway to death, and then walk away. Owen says he will get up and he will kill you because you were too cowardly to kill him. So you should be killing sin or it will be killing you. <coughs> Eternity hangs in the balance here. So how do you battle? How do you take this fight to sin? Here's a few ways. First, you confess sin. You confess your sin. Second, you trust that Jesus forgives your sin. You trust that he forgives your sin. Thirdly, you go on to fight sin. You fight. How do you do that? By guarding your heart and protecting your mind. You guard your affections and you take your thoughts captive. And fifthly, you ground your feet in the word. The word is the fuel for this. The word is the, the battle plan. This isn't that complex. This is Christianity 101 right there. But you can't tap out after number two. You can't confess your sin, trust Jesus to forgive sin, and go home and put your feet up because the war is real. You should know where you're tempted by sin. You should know where the battle is waging in your heart right now because if you're ignorant of it, that's bad news. If you're ignorant of it, it tips the hands that the, the enemy has a foothold. You have to drive it out. Be done with it because the Lord has forgiven us of it.